Ablution in Christianity, Wikipedia article audio Ablution, in religion, is a prescribed washing of part or all of the body of possessions, such as clothing or ceremonial objects, with the intent of purification or dedication. In Christianity, both baptism and foot washing are forms of ablution. In liturgical churches, ablution can refer to purifying fingers or vessels related to the Eucharist. In the New Testament, washing also occurs in reference to rites of Judaism part of the action of a healing by Jesus, the preparation of a body for burial, the washing of nets by fishermen, a person's personal washing of the face to appear in public, the cleansing of an injured person's wounds, Pontius Pilate's washing of his hands as a symbolic claim of innocence and foot washing, now partly a symbolic rite within the Church. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Pontius Pilate declared himself innocent of the blood of Jesus by washing his hands. This act of Pilate may not, however, have been borrowed from the custom of the Jews. The same practice was common among the Greeks and Romans. According to Christian tradition, the Pharisees carried the practice of ablution to great excess. The Gospel of Mark refers to their ceremonial ablutions, for the Pharisees, wash their hands oft or, more accurately, with the fist, or, as Theophylact of Bulgaria explains it, up to the elbow, referring to the actual word used in the Greek New Testament, pi upsilon gamma mu pygm, which refers to the arm from the elbow to the tips of the fingers. In the Book of Acts, Paul and other men performed ablution before entering the temple in Jerusalem, then Paul took the men, and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple, to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Ablution in the Bible Ablution in the Christian Traditions In the Old Testament, ablution was considered a prerequisite to approaching God, whether by means of sacrifice, prayer, or merely by entering a holy place. The Bible has many rituals of purification relating to menstruation, childbirth, sexual relations, nocturnal emission, unusual bodily fluids, skin disease, death, and animal sacrifices. The Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church prescribes several kinds of hand washing for example after leaving the latrine, lavatory, or bathhouse, or before prayer or after eating a meal. The women in the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church are prohibited from entering the church temple during menses, and the men do not enter a church the day after they have had intercourse with their wives. Christianity has always placed a strong emphasis on hygiene, despite the denunciation of the mixed bathing style of Roman pools by early Christian clergy as well as the pagan custom of women naked bathing in front of men, this did not stop the church from urging its followers to go to public baths for bathing, which contributed to hygiene and good health according to the church father, Clement of Alexandria. The church also built public bathing facilities that were separate for both sexes near monasteries and pilgrimage sites, also, the popes situated baths within church basilicas and monasteries since the early Middle Ages. Pope Gregory the Great urged his followers on value of bathing as a bodily need. Contrary to popular belief bathing and sanitation were not lost in Europe with the collapse of the Roman Empire. Soap making first became an established trade during the so-called Dark Ages. The Romans used scented oils among other alternatives. By the mid-19th century, the English urbanist middle classes had formed an ideology of cleanliness that ranked alongside typical Victorian concepts, such as Christianity, respectability, and social progress. 
The Salvation Army has adopted movement of the deployment of the personal hygiene, and by providing personal hygiene products. The Bible has many rituals of purification relating to menstruation, childbirth, sexual relations, nocturnal emission, unusual bodily fluids, skin disease, death, and animal sacrifices. The Bible includes various regulations about bathing. A subsequent seven clean days are then required, culminating in a ritual and temple offering before the Zav is clean of his malady. Eucharistic Ablutions And also references to hand washing. The mikveh in the Bible is a bath used for the purpose of ritual immersion. The word is employed in its broader sense but generally means a collection of water. Several biblical regulations specify that full immersion in water is required to regain ritual purity after ritually impure incidents have occurred. A person was required to be ritually pure in order to enter the temple. In this context, purity and impurity are imperfect translations of the Hebrew tahara and tumah respectively, in that the negative connotation of the word impurity is not intended, rather being impure is indicative of being in a state in which certain things are prohibited until one has become pure again by immersion in a mikveh. Western Christian After the destruction of the temple, the mikveh's main uses remained as follows. Traditionally, Christianity adhered to the biblical regulation requiring the purification of women after childbirth, this practice, was adapted into a special ritual known as the Churching of Women, for which there exists liturgy in the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer, but its use is now rare in Western Christianity. The Churching of Women is still performed in a number of Eastern Christian churches. The Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church prescribes several kinds of hand washing for example after leaving the latrine, lavatory, or bathhouse, or before prayer, or after eating a meal. The women in the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church are prohibited from entering the church temple during menses, and the men do not enter a church the day after they have had intercourse with their wives. Eastern and Oriental Christian Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox and High Church Anglicans are also traditionally required to regularly attend confession, as a form of ritual purification from sin, especially as preparation before receiving the Eucharist. For Catholics, this is required at least once a year and required for those who are guilty of unconfessed mortal sins. Baptismal Ablutions In Reformed Christianity, ritual purity is achieved though the confession of sins, an assurance of forgiveness, and sanctification. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, believers offer their whole being and labor as a living sacrifice, and cleanliness becomes a way of life. Washing of Feet In the Roman Rite the celebrant washes his hands before vesting for Mass, but with another prayer. This is said privately in the vestry. He will then wash his hands again after the offertory this is the ceremony that is known as the lavabo proper. This washing appears in both the Tridentan Mass, the 1962 edition of which is now an authorized extraordinary form of the Roman Rite, and in the Mass of Paul VI. The reason for this second washing of hands probably developed from the long ceremony of receiving the loaves and vessels of wine from the people at the offertory that was used in Rome. In the Gaul icon rite the offerings were prepared before Mass began, as in the Eastern Liturgy of Preparation, so there was no long version of the offertory nor place for a lavabo before the Eucharistic prayer. In the Middle Ages, the Roman Rite actually had two washing of hands, one before and one after the offertory. This first one has since disappeared, 
and the one which remains is the second. In the Tridentine Mass and in the similar Anglo-Catholic Mass, the term ablutions refers to when the priest rinses his hands first in wine and then in water following the communion. It is to be distinguished from the lavabo, when the celebrant washes his hands with water only, reciting the words of Psalm 26 6 12 at the offertory. Ablutions for the Dead In the Mass of Paul VI and the Anglican Eucharist, the priest does not normally use wine to wash his hands at the ablution, although this is permitted, but only water. In the Eastern Orthodox and Greek Catholic churches, the term ablution refers to consuming the remainder of the gifts at the end of the Divine Liturgy. Holy Communion is always received in both species not only by the clergy but also by the faithful. This is accomplished by placing the particles of the consecrated lamb into the chalice, and distributing communion to the faithful with a spoon. The portion which remains in the chalice afterwards must be consumed. The ablutions will normally be performed by the deacon, but if no deacon is serving the priest will do them. After the litany of thanksgiving that follows communion, the deacon will come into the sanctuary and kneel, placing his forehead on the holy table and the priest will bless him to consume the gifts, which is done at the prothesis. First, using the liturgical spoon he will consume all of the body and blood of Christ which remain in the chalice. Then he will pour hot water on the discos which is then poured into the chalice and consumed. Next the liturgical spear, spoon, and chalice will be rinsed first with wine and then with hot water, which are then consumed. All of the sacred vessels are then wiped dry with a towel, wrapped in their cloth coverings and put away. Because the ablutions necessarily require consuming the holy mysteries, a priest or deacon may only perform them after having fully prepared himself through fasting and the lengthy preparation for Holy Communion. When a priest must take Holy Communion to the sick or homebound, if he has not prepared himself to receive the holy mysteries, he may ablute the chalice by pouring water into it and asking the one to whom he brought the sacrament to consume the ablution. Washing and Anointing If the reserved mysteries should become moldy, they must still be consumed in the same manner as the ablutions after liturgy. They should not be burned or buried. To prevent this, when the mysteries are to be reserved for the sick, they should be thoroughly dried before being placed in the tabernacle. Notes In Orthodox Christianity, there is also an ablution performed on the eighth day after baptism. Immediately after being baptized, every person, including an infant, is confirmed using the mystery of chrismation. In the early church, the places where the person was anointed with chrism were carefully bandaged, and were kept covered for eight days. During this period, the newly illumined would also wear his baptismal robe every day. At the end of the eight days, the priest would remove the bandages and baptismal garment and perform ablutions over him. While the bandaging no longer takes place, the ritual ablutions are still performed. By women to achieve ritual purity after menstruation or childbirth before she and her husband may resume marital relations, by men to achieve ritual purity, to immerse newly acquired utensils used in serving and eating food. The newly illumined is brought back to the church by his godparents for the ablutions. The priest stands him in the center of the church, in front of the holy doors, facing east. He loosens the belt of the baptismal robe and prays for him, that God may preserve the newly illumined in purity and illumine him by grace. He then dips a sponge in water and sprinkles him in the sign of the cross saying, Thou art justified. Thou art illumined. Thou art sanctified. Thou art washed, 
in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then, as he says the next prayer, he washes each of the places where he had been anointed with chrism. Next he performs the tonsure, symbolic of the life of self-sacrifice a Christian must lead. Many Christian churches practice a ceremony of the washing of feet, following the example of Jesus in the Gospel. Some interpret this as an ordinance which the church is obliged to keep as a commandment, see also biblical law in Christianity. Others interpret it as an example that all should follow. Most denominations that practice the rite will perform it on Monday Thursday. Often in these services, the bishop will wash the feet of the clergy, and in monasteries the abbot will wash the feet of the brethren. St. Benedict of Nursia lays out in his rule that the feet of visitors to the monastery should be washed, and also that those who are assigned to serve in the kitchen that week should wash the feet of all the brethren. At one time, most of the European monarchs also performed the washing of feet in their royal courts on Monda Thursday, a practice continued by the Austro-Hungarian Emperor and the King of Spain up to the beginning of the 20th century. Foot washing is also observed by numerous Protestant and Proto-Protestant groups, including Seventh-day Adventist, Pentecostal, and pietistic groups, some Anabaptists, and several types of Southern Baptists. Foot washing rites are also practiced by many Anglican, Lutheran, and Methodist churches, whereby foot washing is most often experienced in connection with Monday Thursday services and, sometimes, at ordination services where the bishop may wash the feet of those who are to be ordained. Though history shows that foot washing has at times been practiced in connection with baptism, and at times as a separate occasion, by far its most common practice has been in connection with the Lord's Supper service. The Moravian Church practiced foot washing until 1818. There has been some revival of the practice as other liturgical churches have also rediscovered the practice. When an Orthodox Christian dies, his body is washed and dressed before burial. Although this custom is not considered to impose any sort of ritual purity, it is an important aspect of charitable care for the departed. Ideally, this should not be deferred to an undertaker, but should be performed by family members or friends of the deceased. When an Orthodox priest or bishop dies, these ablutions and vesting are performed by the clergy, saying the same prayers for each vestment that are said when the departed bishop or priest vested for the divine liturgy. After the body of a bishop is washed and vested, he is seated in a chair and the dichorion and trichorion are placed in his hands for the final time. When an Orthodox monk dies, his body is washed and clothed in his monastic habit by brethren of his monastery. Two significant differences are that when his mantle is placed on him, its hem is torn to form bands, with which his body is bound, and his klobuk is placed on his head backwards, so that the monastic veil covers his face. When an Orthodox nun dies, the sisterhood of her convent performs the same ministrations for her as are done for monks. In the Roman Catholic Church, the absut is a symbolic ablution of the deceased's body following the Requiem Mass. While specific prayers are said, the coffin is incensed and sprinkled with holy water. The absolution of the dead is only performed in context of the Tridentan Mass. Following the Second Vatican Council, the absolution of the dead was removed from the funeral liturgy of the Mass of Paul VI. Washing and anointing is a temple ordinance practiced by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and Mormon fundamentalists as part of the faith's endowment ceremony. It is a purification ritual for adults, usually performed at least a year after baptism. 
The ordinance is performed by the authority of the Melchizedek priesthood by an officiator of the same sex as the participant. In the ritual, a person is sprinkled with water to symbolically wash away the blood and sins of this generation. After the washing, the person is then anointed to become a king and priest or a queen and priestess in the afterlife. Once washed and anointed, the participant is dressed in the temple garment, a religious undergarment which the participant is instructed to wear throughout his or her life. Finally, the participant is given a new name which he or she is instructed never to reveal except under certain conditions in the temple. Mormons link the ritual to biblical washings and anointings. The temple garment symbolizes the skins of clothing given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and the new name is linked to Revelation 2.17, which states that God will give those who overcome a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it.